Hi, this is Gautam. For today's episode, we're going to look at the book Where the Gods Dwell. Now, this book is not written by a single author, but it is a compilation of essays written by 13 authors. So, you know, one natural thing about the book is that when it comes to style and the type of writing, you may not find consistency in all the essays written. But the beauty is, even though there is there are some missteps and inconsistency, the 13 essays do bring about the history and the mythology associated with temples, not just in India, but, but also in the Indian subcontinent. When you read the text, you understand that whatever be the size of the temple and whatever be the magnanimous importance given, most of the temples which are discussed in this text always have a humble beginning. And the second important point is about a principle called as the local deity, you know, becoming incorporated with the larger scale of Hindu mythology. You try to simplify it as Sanskritization. For example, you take a particular god or a particular local one, you know, when the temple becomes increasing, uh, you know, when the importance for the temple becomes increasingly higher, then there is a natural tendency that you find mythological stories which one way or the other try to link this local deity or a regional god with the larger scale of the Hindu mythological universe. Most of the essays written are clearly descriptive and they try to portray, you know, even at times the dimensions, the proper design of the sculptures and how one particular temple, when you keep reading, it's not explicitly made, uh, made it to the reader. But when you read the different essays, you naturally find that you get this proper description at the same time you are allowed to naturally understand and differentiate how one temple is different from the other. The history and the mythologies associated with the temples are really interesting. For example, Manu Espillai in the description on Sri Padmanamaswavi temple states that the temple reached its heights under Martha and Varma and before that it has very humble beginnings. If we take the Brihadishwara temple of Thanjur, which was built by the Solas, of course we do know it, the, you know, the great architecture and marvels uh, which finds its place in the UNESCO World, Her World Heritage Site. But what is less known is the fact that once the British took over uh, the region of Tamil Nadu, the temple was not really taken care of and uh, it was the Maratha icons who actually took care of the temple. For example, the Maratha noble uh, Tulaji II. And the uh, temples in Belur and Halabedu, which were constructed by the Hoysalas, had a unique type of architecture which merged the styles of both north and south of the Vindhi and Sapura mountains. The Ramapa temple, which were constructed by the Kakatiyas, on the other hand, were actually important for the history because the Kakatiya kingdom and their kinship did not belong to the Kshatriya clan and for uh, properly having that royal heritage and to have that authority that they could be rulers of the land, they had to construct the temple uh, to make sure that they get their divine blessings. And once one goes to the Nilachal Kamakya temple, you understand how during several years of renovation in Assam, the core structure of the temple was not affected, but it has only evolved over a larger time period. In Maharashtra, the Vidoba temple in Pandarpur has a beautiful history associated with the, the, associated with the devotee of Ramdev. And during the discussion on Somnath temple, Vikran Pandey brings about so many stories from Hindu mythology, especially from Mahabharat, where he talks about the closeness between Vishnu and Shiva. In the discussion on the Kajraha group of monuments, Trisha Gupta writes about the fact that the Tantric philosophy and the Tantric association relationship with Buddhism and Hinduism might be one of the major factors which led to the creation of those beautiful sculptures which explicitly mention and explicitly carve several sexual fantasies. Not restricting the discussion to just India, there are essays which talk about the Kilakatas temple in Pakistan, how there are attempts in Pakistan by the Hindus for revival. We also understand how the Pasupatinath temple in the country of Nepal is a symbol of authority, not just during the monarchy, but even after the creation of the Nepalese Republic. And finally, 
the icon of Jaffna, the Nallur Kandaswami temple. And as you can clearly see in this picture, the architecture is not strictly Hindu style, but a combination of several styles, especially the arch. And the final chapter talks about the ruins of temples in the land of Jammu and Kashmir. Well, one major complaint of the book is the fact that there aren't many illustrations or photographs. Well, it is true that at the start of every chapter, there is an illustration of the temple. But when the uh, chapter tries to describe even intricate more details, it would have been much better if some photographs were added. And I do understand that when you add more photographs and illustrations, the pricing of the book would definitely become higher. But still, they could have released it as, uh, you know, as an edition with more photographs and illustrations with a different cover design maybe as a different edition of the book rather than this one. That's it for today's review. Meet you in the next episode. So, bye for now.